In October 1857, the six-man Aiken party was passing through Utah on their way to California. They were suspected by the Mormon Church as being spies for the U.S. Army. The men were caught and killed without a trial by Mormon henchman Bill Hickman, Porter Rockwell, and others. J. H. Beadle wrote about the incident as explained to him by Bill Hickman. He wrote, The party consisted of six men. On reaching Kaysville, 25 miles north of Salt Lake City, they were all arrested on the charge of being spies for the government. The Aiken party had stock, property, and money estimated at $25,000. Nothing being proved against them, they were told they should be sent out of the territory by the southern route. Hosea Stout, another Mormon henchman, confirmed that the Aiken party had been taken prisoner. Stout wrote in his diary, Cal mail came, and six Cal prisoners taken at Box Elder, supposed spies, guarding the prisoners from Cal. Orrin Porter Rockwell with three or four others started with four of the prisoners, which we had been guarding for some days, south to escort them through the settlements to Cal via South Route. The other two are going to be permitted to go at large and remain till spring, and the guard dismissed. Beetle continued, four of them started leaving Buck and one of the unknown men in the city. The party had for an escort, Orrin Porter Rockwell, John Lott, Miles, and one other. When they reached Nephi, 100 miles south, Rockwell informed the bishop, Bryant, that his orders were to have the men used up there. Bishop Bryant called a council at once, and the following men were selected to assist. J. Bigler, now a bishop, P. Pitchforth, his first counselor, John Kink, and Picton. The selected murderers, at 11 p.m., started from the tithing house and got ahead of the Akins, who did not start till daylight. The latter reached the Severe River when Rockwell informed them they could find no other camp that day. They halted when the other party approached and asked to camp with them, for which permission was granted. The weary men removed their arms and heavy clothing and were soon lost in sleep. The escort and the party from Nephi attacked the sleeping men with clubs and the kingbolts of the wagons. Two died without a struggle, but John Aiken bounded to his feet, but slightly wounded, and sprang into the brush. A shot from the pistol of John Kink laid him senseless. Colonel also reached the brush, receiving a shot in the shoulder from Port Rockwell, and believing the whole party had been attacked by banditti, he made his way back to Nephi. With almost superhuman strength he held out during the twenty-five miles, ghastly pale and drenched with his own blood, staggering feebly along the streets of Nephi. His story elicited a well-feigned horror. Meanwhile, the murderers had gathered up the other three and thrown them into the river, supposing all to be dead. But John Aiken revived and crawled out on the same side, and hiding in the brush, heard these terrible words. Are the damned Gentiles all dead, port? All but one. The son of a bitch ran. Supposing himself to be meant, Aiken lay still till the Danites left, then set out for Nephi. To return to Nephi offered but slight hope, but it was his only hope. He sank helpless at the door of the first house he reached, but the words he heard infused new life into him. The woman, afterwards a witness, said to him, Why another of you ones got away from the robbers, and is at Brother Foot's? Thank God, it is my brother, he said, and started on. The citizens tell with wonder that he ran the whole distance, his hair clotted with blood, reeling like a drunken man all the way. It was not his brother, but Colonel. Bishop Bryant came, extracted the balls, dressed the wounds, and advised the men to return, as soon as they were able, to Salt Lake City. According to the main witness, a woman of Nephi, all regarded them as doomed. They had got four miles on the road, when their driver, a Mormon named Wolf, stopped the wagon near an old cabin, informed them he must water the horses, unhitch them, and moved away. Two men then stepped from the cabin and fired with double-barreled guns. Aiken and Colonel were both shot through the head and fell dead from the wagon. Their bodies were then loaded with stone and put in one of those bottomless springs, so-called, common in that part of Utah. Meanwhile, Rockwell and party had reached the city, taken Buck and the other man, and started southward, plying them with liquor. They reached the point of the mountain. There, it was decided to use them up, and they were attacked with slung shots and billies. The other man was instantly killed. Buck leaped from the wagon, outran his pursuers, their shots missing him, swam the Jordan, and came down it on the west side. He reached the city and related all that occurred, which created quite a stir. Hickman was then sent for to finish the job, which he did as related in the text. Hickman stated that he went to see Brigham Young, who said, The boys have made a bad job of trying to put a man out of the way. They all got drunk, bruised up a fellow, and he got away from them at the point of the mountain, came back to this city, and is telling all that happened, which is making a big stink. Hickman claimed that Brigham told him to get the man out of the way and use him up. He also claimed that this last surviving member of the Aiken party, named Buck, trusted a man named George Dalton, who lured him to a secluded spot, where Hickman was waiting to ambush him. Hickman claimed to have shot him in the head. Hickman then went to Brigham Young's, told him that Buck was taken care of, and there would be no more stink about his stories. He said he was glad of it. Buck was the last one of the Aiken's party. Utah Supreme Court Justice R. N. Baskin explained the event in more detail, according to what he was told by Hickman. He said, 
I remember distinctly that Hickman in relating that occurrence to me said that Buck, when he was shot, sprang out of the wagon, and while he was struggling on the ground, Meacham dismounted and drove his bowie knife twice into his body. He was up to this event, the sole survivor of the Aiken party, who were murdered by Porter Rockwell and his ever-ready assistants at the point of the mountain, on the road to Lehigh.